All right, everyone. Welcome to Mentored Life, a weekly show where we interview entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Mitchell Smedley, and today I'm interviewing Spencer Taggart. Hey, everybody. So Spencer uh, has been involved in a variety of different, uh, what do you call them, industries? Startups, businesses, industries, yes. Yeah? I, yeah. Okay. Among which are social media, uh, marketing, uh, and other types of business that I'm actually about to find out for myself right now. So, Spencer, what was your very first business venture? Oh, man. Well, young. I mean, I think most entrepreneurs, they have it in their blood. And so mine would have been selling brownies and golf balls at Jeremy Ranch Country Club, selling, you know, lemonade to the golfers that went by, and then we'd go and we'd collect golf balls in the streams at nights and then sell them to the golfers driving by. Really? Yeah. I remember when I was like eight, in the summers I'd also sew. I learned how to use a sewing machine and I'd sew little bags and then I would just, I don't know why anybody would buy them. I was like eight or nine wow. and I'd go door to door and sell my bags to, to people. As an eight-year-old? Yeah. Wow. Oh, for sure. I mean, I think I've been doing startups and businesses my whole life, but it's in my blood. My dad's an entrepreneur. He started several companies. I see him around campus a lot, OGO. It's like a, a bag oh, that company. Backpack. Yeah. Backpacks and golf bags and travel bags and And that was your dad? Yeah. That was your father that started yeah. that. Wow, interesting. When I was a little little lad. So he's he's done lots of different companies. So I think it's just a part of my blood. Okay. Very cool. So as a young kid you were already kinda into the whole business mindset. Yeah. I mean that's pretty smart to go collect golf balls and then sell them. Yeah, the, um, so the profit margins golfers. are quite quite high when you find the golf balls in a stream that they lost and then they have to buy it back from you. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, the captive audience. I mean, some of the business principles are pretty solid because you set up right on the golf cart path so they can't pass you. Uh -huh. You've got great drinks and brownies and golf balls and, you know, you're this cute little kid with his buddy or, your si or my sister. And uh -huh. We'd sell, we'd make, I made so much money doing that as a kid. It was incredible. Wow. Yeah. Man, there's very few eight-year-olds I know would be patient enough to go do that. It was fun. Yeah, for us it was fun. My kids love it too. It's funny. So this is interesting, okay? So my kids always like to do a lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. But in any business, you have to have an audience. Well, on our street, we don't get a lot of traffic. And so as a family, we sat down and said, where could we go that's relatively close that has a ton of traffic. And right down our street is Tanner Park. It's a big dog park. And so hundreds of people come there to, to walk their dogs every Saturday. So we went and set up right there and we sold five gallons of lemonade in like an hour and 10 minutes. My kids wow. brought all these toys to sell. I think we made like 180 bucks in that fast. Wow. The kids were, were pretty pumped. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. So, okay, so you, you, you grew up. What was your first uh, more serious business venture? Uh, good question. So I'll skip, I'll do, because pre-mission I did a bunch of different things. Okay. But then after my mission, my wife and I had an opportunity to move out to Fresno, California. We were invited by this unbelievably brilliant businessman to go and do a land development company. And so we had never done any. Now my dad has always done land development. It was one of his buddies. And my, I went up and on a big table just like this, this guy's name's John Quiddiquit, okay? And he is nutty brilliant. He said, Spence, here's how you do land development. He brought a map of like a city and he'd show me the, you know, the edges of the city and where the city's gonna grow and build. And he said, you gotta go talk to these farmers and convince them to basically buy their land so that you can build and expand the city limits. I had an hour crash course at one of his homes in Park City and uh, literally I think two days later my wife and I moved to California, quit our jobs and uh, started a business and it was crazy though. So it's interesting because with business there's a lot of components. One is, do you have a clue what you're doing, mm -hmm. which sometimes you don't. Like my wife and I, we had never done land development, didn't have a clue. Two is timing. They say that, you know, 
location is to real estate as timing is to business. So we just hit it at the right time. We went down and the market was insane. It was the real estate bubble. Sadly, the bubble burst. Right. But About what year was this, 2006? 2005 is when we went down. And within about a year and a half, we had bought and sold $180 million worth of real estate and developed, like I, one deal I put together, it was, it was a $52 million deal with like 4,000 houses. Wow. Yeah. No, it was How nuts. old were you? I was 25. Wow, that's really young to be handling that kind of money. Yeah, no, it that's was impressive. nuts. That's impressive. I was 25 and we had land deals like crazy. And it, it's interesting, it taught me a lot because John, this guy, quitty quit, he said, hey, if you go down there within a year and you get one deal, like I will pay for you and your wife to go on a big trip to Europe. And so we're thinking, okay, we got to get at least one. Well, in the first eight months, we had bought and sold eight. And it was like, why? Why were we able to do something that was so unexpected? Why were we able to lock down so many deals where other people couldn't? And I'll tell, let me just, I'm gonna look at the yeah, camera, I can't. Do. So one of the things that, that I learned is how to serve your audience, how to help their dreams come true. And so it's interesting because I was competing with these huge companies, like these massive publicly held billion dollar builders and they were fighting after these same properties, talking to the exact same farmers that I was. But I would get a deal, turn around and two days later sell it to that builder. And it was like, what was the difference? So here's some interesting things about knowing your audience. Well, instead of showing up in like a BMW 750 or in a suit and intimidating these farmers, I went out, I bought a big, big pickup truck, mm -hmm. big four door truck. I got a cowboy hat, jeans, and a big belt buckle. And I'd show up to the local diners and just start meeting people, getting to know them. And then once I understood who they were and where they lived, I had already done some research on like who they were and everything. Mm -hmm. I literally would say, hey, my wife and I were down here, my dad just moved down, and we're literally trying to make people's dreams come true. And I'd say, what are you most passionate about? What do you want? Where do you see yourself? And they'd always say, I just love farming. I want my kids to be able to farm this land. And they were so afraid of losing their land to become city. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do is I'd say, well, would you ever think about farming more land? Like, would you like a bigger farm? And they're like, yeah, but it's so expensive. And it's like, well, to buy farmland, it's five, at that time it was 5,000, now it's 30,000, but $5,000 an acre. Well, I was paying them anywhere from 100 to $200,000 an acre because their property was so much more valuable, not as farmland. And so I'd talk to them and say, well, what if we were able to take your property and you could take all that extra money and buy a farm 20 times bigger, but just two miles down the street? three miles down the street. Mm -hmm. And so by listening to them and understanding what they wanted and what they cared about, I'd get the deal every time. And the builders were, they hated me. <laughs> because I would turn around and I would buy their, I would get a contract and I would turn around literally two days later and assign the contract to the builder that was trying to get it. Wow. It was nuts. Okay. For like a $5 million assignment fee. In two days, we'd make $5 million. Oh my gosh. It was nuts. Very difficult to do unless it's a really hot market. Now, I didn't make millions and millions of dollars because the bubble burst mm -hmm. and a lot of these builders walked away. They just went bankrupt. And so they could never close on the oh, deals. Oh, they could never. Okay. Yeah. But I learned a lot of amazing principles about a couple of things that I actually wanted to talk about on the show. Okay. And I've seen it time and time and time again, and I always teach my students, why does any business exist? What do you think? It fulfills a need. Okay, it fulfills a need. And if you have a need, what is the business 
doing for you. There's a word that I love using. I've said it today. Service. Serve, yes. Every single organization exists to serve. And the companies that understand that are those that explode, are those that do really well, okay? You exist as an organization, whether you're a nonprofit, a for-profit, a, you know, a water park, a wallet company, a makeup company, it doesn't matter. Your whole purpose is to serve someone. And so if you think about it that way and you think, how do I truly serve you most effectively? And if, they, if, an, if an audience feels that from you, they're willing to trust you. They're willing to be loyal to you. They're willing to even pay you more than the next guy because you are putting your heart and soul into making their lives better, faster, cheaper, more fun, whatever it may be. And so that's a foundational principle that if you're going to start a business, you have to understand how do I serve someone more effectively. Hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. You don't hear that a lot in the business world. You don't. It's all about, hey, you got to sell. How do I make money the fastest? Right. How do, how I, do I make, make the highest the margins? How do I do this? But if you learn how to serve someone, that's when you change the world. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. It's fun. So you did the land development deal, the yeah. bubble burst. Bubble burst. Where'd you and your wife go? Well, we went to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> we, we really did the bubble burst. And it was like, okay, we gotta, we gotta have a total paradigm shift. What are we gonna do? And so we're on the beach in Hawaii, just like praying and trying to figure out what's the next step. And literally Heavenly Father kind of brought back the words of, um, President Hinckley saying, you have to get as much education as you possibly can. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And so uh, we felt like, okay, let's go and get an education. And I always wanted to go to Thunderbird. Yeah, Thunderbird. So you went to Thunderbird. Yeah. And uh, got into Thunderbird, had an amazing experience. Uh, it changed my life again, you know, just learning and building relationships. The two things that I, I learned this from another brilliant man that we started a think tank and a, and a startup lab together. He's a billionaire genius guy. And he always taught, he said, there's two things that no one can ever take away from you that are the most valuable in any business, knowledge and relationships. Anyone can take away your money, they can take away your patents, they can take away so many other things, but nobody can take your knowledge and relationships. And those are the two most valuable assets that you ever can have. I do want to ask you, so before you ever went to California, had you been to college before? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so Thunderbird's an MBA school, international business stuff. So school's interesting. It was, in my mind, it was a means to an end and I just kind of needed to do it for my wife, for my, just my sanity, my parents. It was part of our culture. To go to school. To go to school, to get okay. an education. But I didn't want to go, and so I just, it was like, how do I get done the absolute fastest? So I was working at Wells Fargo, working 30 hours a week at the bank, and I got done with my undergrad degree, four-year bachelor's degree, in less than two and a half years. Because yeah. I would take anywhere from 20 to 24 credits every semester while working 30 hours at the bank. You put your head down and you ran. Oh, I just go, like what you're doing right now, you're doing so many different things, but think of all the, the relationships you're building and all the stuff that you're learning. And I feel like when you pack your life with things, when you're anxiously in good, engaged in a good cause, you progress, you don't have time to be lazy. You don't mm -hmm. have time to waste, and so you don't waste time, you just crush it. I became the number one teller in the nation at Wells Fargo while going to school. While well, taking and 18 to 20 credits. Yeah, well, 20 to 24 credits. Oh, 20 to 20, jeez, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Yeah, and so, and I'd go in the summer, I mean, it was like, let's just get this done so that I can never have to go back to school again. Mm -hmm. I, I never wanted to go to school again, but after the land development and stuff, it was like, okay, we have some time to think. Let's go, let's go back to school. And that's what Heavenly Father wanted, and, and it changed my life. I learned how to think again. I learned how to, how to 
just see the world in a different light. And so whether you get education formally or whether you get education by doing, by learning, by starting, by failing fast or not mm -hmm. failing at all, <laughs> what yeah. Brother Little said, you need to continue learning and progressing or you'll die. One of my favorite lines in, mo in a movie was this guy was like, well, yeah, I've got 20 years experience. And this guy looks at him, he's like, no, you don't. You have one year experience 20 times. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Because so many people get stuck doing the same thing every year and they're not actually progressing and learning. Where right now you're doing new things, you're testing new technologies, you're trying different things, you're, you're learning so much right now. And I say, never stop doing that or you're dead. Like I just bought a camera uh, after a consulting gig that Guy and I did, and I was like, I need to learn how to be, be behind the camera. Even though I get paid to not be behind the camera, I'm like, I need to learn. I need to continue pushing my skill set so that I can add more value wherever I go. Mm -hmm. So never stop learning. But Thunderbird was amazing. Be careful, though, about just going to school for the sake of going to school because to this day, I mean, I graduated, what, 10 years ago with my MBA, and several of my, my you know, what do you call them, student, co-students, colleagues, uh, classmates, classmates. 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 <laughs> several of my classmates are still paying off their student loans. I had a buddy the other day, he still has $220,000 in student debt. His oh student goodness. loan payment a month is $2,300, and he's only paying interest. Oh my goodness. That's more than my house payment, and I have a, an okay house. Yeah, what is he doing? I have no idea, he's dying, I'm sure. Like, oh how goodness. do you pay that off? 10 years later and you still have 200,000 in debt? You can't. So be very careful about going to school. Make sure the investment is worth it. So, yeah, be very careful about that. Wow. That's nuts. We actually had a really interesting conversation in our last episode with a, with a girl named Savannah Allred. She's only 18. She is, uh, I believe she said she was a junior. I'd have to go back and confirm In college? That. But yeah. And See? her little brother's 15 and he is an, he's getting an associate's degree in a couple months. That's what I'm talking about. But they did homeschool and they really, they really just pushed themselves. Anyways, they're thinking about dropping out of college, both of them. Yeah. Because what are you learning? What are they learning? They're learning way more running their own businesses. Oh, way more. Oh, you guys, man. sorry. I mean, if if my kid was 18 right now or just home from his mission or just home from her mission and they were like, "Where should I go to school?" I would say unless heavenly father is telling you to go to school or unless you want to be an attorney, unless you want to be a doctor, unless you want to be, you know, an accountant and you have to go to school for it, I would highly recommend don't go and pay a ton of money to learn about things that you don't know if you'll ever use. I recommend, I had a, a, re, a missionary call me the other day and, and said, can I come and job shadow you? And it was like, oh, brilliant. Because then you can see, is this something I'm even interested in? My brother-in-law got a master's degree from Utah State, became an engineer thinking, oh, that's going to be a great, great you know, career move for me. So he spends five years of his life and tons of money becoming an engineer through school. And like three months into his first job, he's like, this is horrible. Oh. I hate being an engineer. What was I doing? He just wasted. And then he started his own company and he now owns an online furniture business and has for about 10 years and crushes it. Wow. And it's like, he never uses any of the engineering stuff that he learned. Uh -uh. And so instead of spending all of this time and all of this money getting an education that may or may not be useful, especially when they teach traditional stuff, mm -hmm. you're wasting time and money. Go do an internship. Go job shadow somebody. Go do an apprenticeship. Find somebody, because if you do an apprenticeship, you're learning skills that are relevant to that industry right now, and you're building relationships, and it's not costing you any money. Even if you do it for free, it's way more valuable than what you're paying for in school. 
And think, I wrote a degree for school. I tried to write it in a way so that all of the learning was actual real learning. You're not just learning from 20-year-old textbooks. You're doing projects that are building your resume, that are building your portfolio. You're, you know, you're doing real work, and that's how you're learning. Mm -hmm. So if you can find an education that does that, we really try to do that at LDS Business College. But most educational institutions don't do that. No. One thing, I mean, just from like looking around and trying to keep an open mind, you kind of realize, okay, most colleges, in fact, all colleges, they're a business. They're a business. They're in it to make money. So of course they're going to tell you, to make it in life, you have to have a degree. You have to. Or you're going to die. You're yeah. Gonna, you're, you'll, you'll be a bone. That's bollocks. I don't know if that's a bad word, but that's terrible. That's <laughs> you know, false. <laughs> you never heard that word before. <laughs> yeah, they, you hear that all over the place. It's an interesting, this is why education will shift like crazy over the next five, ten years, is education as businesses, universities, they focused on serving the wrong audience. For so many years, educational institutions have been serving the professor. It's all about making the professor look good, about getting them published, getting them into their spheres so they can go chat with 15 other colleagues and puff themselves up and say, look how intelligent my research is. And it's like, the student has been shafted because it's all focused on serving the professor. Wow. That's, what, that's what all big uh, universities are focused on, is publishing and research and all of that. And they never serve the student. That's why you're not prepared to go get a job. That's why 80% of students graduating with a bachelor's degree have no clue what they even want to do let alone if they learned any skills to help them get a job. Mm -hmm. They don't even know what job they want. It's a, it's a disaster. So highly consider, I'm sorry if my in-laws are watching this, but he's a doctor, she's a you know, social worker, they both have master, massive yeah. degrees. And, but if you want to do that, you have to go to school. That's, yeah, you have, you have to. to. Yeah, but the ROI is there because they train you to be that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. The old professor thing uh, that you said they, they puffed themselves up. That's a scripture. It is. It's that's prophesied. Doctrine. It's prophesied. Yeah, so that exists. Yeah, they're serving the wrong person. They're serving themselves, and so the student gets left behind. Mm -hmm. They get left in the dust, and we're learning from textbooks that these professors sell to us that they wrote 25 years ago that aren't relevant today. Things change. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. interesting. That is a whole nother... That's a different that's a conversation, topic. yeah. And that one we kind of had. Sorry for that tangent, okay. but that was very intriguing to me. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's continue on with the story. Kay. So, Thunderbird, you got a fantastic education in what did you study? Yeah, business. Just so business in general? International business. So, there's a focus on marketing. You could do an emphasis or a focus, but I chose marketing. But as an MBA, you learn well, as much as you can about accounting and negotiations and sales. My negotiations class was my favorite. But it was an international business school, so the majority of the students are actually from different countries around the world. So it just gave you such a different like, perspective on how people think, how people engage with brands, how people build relationships. It was, it was really cool. And now I've got friends all over the world that if we needed to do something in Japan or Korea or you know Germany or whatever, I could just reach out to my classmates and say, hey, let's do something cool. That's where knowledge and relationships are valuable. If you're going to get an education, you have to dive into the knowledge, but the relationships are just as important, if not more important, through your education. Mm -hmm. The relationships you're building here at LDS Business College far outweigh most of the stuff that you'll never remember in right. class. In fact, that's one of the, that is the reason I came to business college. Yeah. I came in, talked to Barrett Christensen. He goes, I go, what can you teach me about social media that I cannot learn on my own? He goes, absolutely nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. I go, well, you're one heck of a salesman. He goes, well, I'll just be honest with you. The relationships and the people you'll meet here, the networking opportunities, that's where the gold is. Barrett, see, genius, exactly. Shout out to Barrett. I love Barrett. Barrett is amazing, yeah. And now he's cool practicing what so much he learned here at the LDS Business College. So think of Barrett, what your professors, your, your colleagues, your classmates, those need to be intimate relationships that you have the rest of your life. 
think of Barrett as a mentor, as a, as a guide, as a resource forever. Mm -hmm. For sure. He's working with some of the biggest, most powerful causes in the world. And if they're looking for somebody to do video work or somebody to do an internship, tell Barrett, I'm in. Like, let me go learn and serve these companies and let me learn. It's awesome. Man, it's yeah. very cool. The relationships you develop here are fantastic. They're good. But, I mean, truth is, you can develop them anywhere you are. Anywhere. You just have to be willing to put yourself out there, I imagine. You have to. I love what you said, what Barrett said. Is there anything that I could learn here that I couldn't learn anywhere else? No. There is so much content out there to learn from. The internet has opened learning and made it so accessible to all of us. We just need to have the diligence and the dedication to go and get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the truth. Okay, so let's, we need to continue on okay. with, with, with your business. story. With business, okay. With business in general. Okay, so you went and got a degree. Where, where, where was your next move? Where'd you go? So I went, started working for an advertising agency, which was also a great experience. Um, learned a ton. It was called Struck. We had lots of big clients. Uh, got to travel the world and, and meet a lot of amazing people. I mean, Disney, DreamWorks. We had Lego. We had, you know, the country of New Zealand we were pitching. Country of Mexico's digital stuff. Wow. And, and I say Adidas. Yeah, I mean, like lots of just uber cool, fun companies. So I learned a lot about strategy and brand and storytelling and design and, and pitching as well. And that was awesome. Then I went and worked at Blend Tech, uh, the blender company, and we did a huge viral campaign. It's known and recognized as the number one viral campaign of all time. Will it blend? So Tom and I are close. He just called me yesterday. I mean, think of the relationships you're building. Mm -hmm. And who is Tom? Tom Dixon. He's the owner of Blend Tech, founder, creator, and he's the one in the videos, blending up all the stuff. Oh, the guy in the video. Yeah, is he, the it's owner. his company. He invented oh my goodness. those. Yeah. Okay. And so, he and I would travel around and talk about viral marketing and talk about social media and YouTube and just it was so neat. From there, because of kind of my role there, I was invited to this think tank, this thing called the Social Commerce Institute. And we were simultaneously building a think tank, which was like this collaboration group of about 150 different companies where we tried to really understand social media and marketing and tried to understand like how do we use strategy even though the world is changing so fast. How do we not fail and create this strategic framework so that regardless of what platform we're on or regardless of what our company is, we can use this framework and just crush it with marketing every time. And that's actually what I built the whole degree based on, is what we learned and what we developed there. The second thing we were doing is a startup lab. And so the relationships and knowledge we learned in the think tank, we'd apply to lots of different startups. Mm -hmm. But Heavenly Father was not a big fan of me sticking around there and wanted me to come to LDS <laughs> Business College. And so came to LDS Business College and started here, wrote the degree, and for the last three and a half years have had an amazing journey. Like, it's been so fun working at LDS Business College, but now I'm at BonCom and uh -huh. it's insane, lights out, fun. It's kind of an entrepreneurial spirit in what we're building there. and. While at LDS Business College, I think I started seven companies with students, with other people, with, um, with other venture capital friends, and just a blast. Wow. I think, I mean, it was so fun because applying what we learned and what we're teaching to a real business, that's when you learn by far the most. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah. So my life's been pretty nuts. Yeah, you've kind of been all over the place. Yeah. But in the process, it seems like you've learned a ton. Oh, just, just what we said earlier, never stop learning. Because I, I feel like I can add so much more value today than I could even a year ago. And wow. way more value than I could 10 years ago. Yeah. Now when people ask me questions, it's like, oh, I've, I've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. I know what, what works and what doesn't work, and I've got so much to learn still, too. So... Wow. 
Yeah. That is really cool. So you say you're working at Boncom now. That's short for Bonneville Communications. Yeah. What is? Can you tell us a little bit what you do there? So Boncom is like another agency. It's I've worked in an agency before, but this agency, Boncom, we are focused on serving causes. We have found that there is a massive gap between belief and action. Like let's let's use the scriptures for example. Okay. I may believe in the scriptures, but that doesn't mean I act and read the scriptures every day. So what we found is this gap between those two, we call it potential energy. And so our whole vision at Boncom is to unlock that potential energy. And we work for causes. And so people that believe in certain things, but they haven't taken the step to act, we want to unlock all of that potential energy. And the way that we've been doing that is through a lot of strategy and campaigns and creative. We do a lot of the campaigns. We help with some of the LDS church campaign stuff. Um, but we're focused on serving causes that will change the world. One of the ways that we also do it is through influencer marketing. And that's, a, I think, one of the futures. If it might be the future of marketing. Because us as consumers, we're trusting brands less and less and less. I mean, the, the, the research shows that if a brand says, oh, I do this well, we don't care. But if one of our friends or an influencer, somebody that we trust says, this brand does this well, we're all in. And so influencers are those people that have an online presence and will influence your decision. And whether they have 1,000 followers or 10 billion followers, well, nobody had 10 billion, but 10 million followers, okay. They would be considered an influencer as long as they are getting people to do certain things. And so we're trying to figure out how do we really build an influencer network so that when we have a cause, we can unleash that influencer network and really create some change and really grow some action and growth. Um, it sounds like it's similar to a campaign that uh, you guys recently did, and I got uh, I had the opportunity to help with uh, hashtag Light the World. Yeah, campaign that seemed to be kind of the main strategy that, exactly. that, that John Dye was involved with. Yes, so the missionary department of the church, you know, they say, hey, let's do a seasonal campaign around Christmas, light the world. It was by far the best campaign that we've ever done to, to get people to act, to get people involved and to do something, not just post about something, to be, but to go do something. Go do something. And to get other people to share about it, to have user-generated content. Mm -hmm. Because if I see my friends and my, the people that I follow and all these other people getting involved in something and they're serving and having fun and making a difference, I'm way more likely to get involved. And that was the whole goal of the campaign and it, it worked really well. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. That was really cool. Could you cover some of the basic strategy behind that campaign? Well, so, okay, basic strategy I think is why do you do this you know what's the vision well it's to help bring people to Christ how do we help them feel the true spirit of Christmas how do we get them to have a wonderful experience by themselves with their family with their friends and feel the spirit so that they are moved to to want to have more of Christ in their life so that would be kind of the high level why I wasn't a part of the campaign so I'm Okay. I'm guessing on all this stuff, oh, so maybe okay. I shouldn't even maybe I shouldn't dive in. <laughs> okay, oh, but because you recently started. At yeah, I, di I didn't start until February first, so I oh, missed. Okay. I mean, I saw it and I was That's part true. of it, but I don't, I don't know all the the all official the strategy details. that the church came up with, but but it was powerful. I mean, when you think about strategy, it's all strategy are these three questions: why, who, what. Everything else is a tactical question. Everything else is a tactical question. So Everything. So the question that everyone needs to ask themselves is, why? Why, and that is, what is my vision and what are my goals? Okay. Who is narrowing down your audience? How do I, how do I fully understand my audience? Who are my influencers? How do I connect with my audience? And then three is, what is my message? And how do I communicate that effectively so that I 
resonate with my audience, and achieve my goals. In that order, why, who, what? Why, who, what? In that order. If you can lock that down, I've written and taught about that. Like when we, when I teach the strategy class, it's why, who, what for 14 weeks. The first eight weeks are just why. Hmm. Understanding the vision. Understanding how do I really understand where I'm going. Because if you don't know where you're going, you'll never get there. You can't really have success unless you clearly define exactly where you're going. And that's why most people struggle. They see the world like this, and so they progress like this. And they, they're busy, and they're active, and they're, they're moving along. But they're not act if they narrow their focus and simplify and define their vision, they move in a straight line, not like this. It huh. saves so much time, so much energy, it's so much more powerful. If you look at all the best companies in the world, they clearly know their vision. Clearly. And they don't stray from it. Wow. Yeah. Would you say most companies have a clear vision statement? No, absolutely not. Really? I would say maybe 5% of companies have a clear vision. 5%? Maybe. Wow. That'd be generous. Most companies are just going, but they don't really know where they're going. They haven't clearly defined it. The employees don't know, their audience doesn't know, their customers don't know, and therefore they'll never really get there. You can't truly be successful unless you clearly define it. Mm -hmm. You'll always be chasing something. That's why most companies probably fail. That's why they meander. That's why they don't explode, because huh. they don't have a clear, simple vision. That's why we spend the first eight weeks trying to help understand what that means. What the vision it's, is. It's the hardest thing to do. So it actually sounds a little bit tricky. It's when really I hard. when I was when I came up with the idea for Mentored Live, I had no clue why exactly like I wanted to do yeah. it. I knew that I wanted to do something. Yeah. But I didn't have a serious what. And there's a lot of uh, people that you've been a mentor to that I wanted their help. They wouldn't help me until they go, okay, well what's your why? What's your who, what? Yeah, that you have to know you those had things. To. So I have a serious question for you, and I'm asking you this in all honesty. What do you do if you you think you have an idea that works, but you're not exactly sure what the why is? Should you just like stop all work until you have that figured out, or should you progress? And I mean, do you ever figure out the why as you trot along? Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it is way better if you can step back and take the time and be patient and understand, why am I doing this? Because if you don't have a why, then you're going to lose motivation. You're going to lose interest. You're going to lose passion. When you wake up in the morning, you're like, OK, I'm going to go do an interview, but I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets old really fast. But if you're like, I am doing these to change people's lives, to inspire entrepreneurship and save the economy or something, <laughs> it's like, you wake up and you're like, oh, we're changing the US economy through entrepreneurship. I have to get out of bed and I have to learn from these entrepreneurs and share it with everyone. Like the minute you have your why, the motivation, the drive, the all of the people, the what the who becomes very clear. If you know that your vision is to save the US economy through entrepreneurship, you then know who can I get on the show to help accomplish that? You need to know who's my audience. All of a sudden, when you have a clear why, everything changes. Then your what, your message, becomes extremely clear. Hmm. I need to help serve entrepreneurs so that we can change the economy together. And then when you are, like when, when I was on the show, I didn't really know, I'm going to just call you out on it. I didn't call know why out. I was coming. It was like, hey, a bunch of people told me you needed to interview Spence, and so, OK, here I am. But if you help me understand why you're doing this, I would have been able to serve you so much more effectively. You would know exactly what kind of questions to ask. You would know everything. The, one of the most powerful things about the why is at that moment, you know what to say yes to and what to say no to. Saying no to things is one of the most powerful and empowering, freeing elements 
of a clear vision, of strategy. It's because you can eliminate the clutter. When somebody says, can I come be on your show? And it's like, well, will that person help us change the U.S. economy through entrepreneurship? No. Mm. Oh, thanks so much for wanting to be on my show. No, thanks. You can say yeah. no so confidently because it doesn't align with your vision. If this is where you're going, that would take you off course, and it doesn't help you get there. But if you don't have that clearly defined, you're going to go like this, and it's going to take a long time to get there. So in answer to your question, it's much better if you can define the why, and it's okay to change the why once in a while, mm -hmm. to say, I found a deeper meaning, I found a more simple way. I recently feel like I need to change my personal vision in life. And you're always going to be adjusting, but if you don't have some idea of the why, don't waste your time. You're going to fail hmm. eventually. Wow. So find it. Find your why. Find your, and sometimes you have to do it a few times and, and it'll come, but that's just harder. I understand. Yeah, don't, don't stop, you know. Don't, don't not progress and move forward if you don't have it clearly defined. Uh -huh. At least have a general idea before you start going, though. Okay. Even if it's simple. Okay. All right. Love you guys. Beautiful. Spencer, thank you so much for being yeah, on the show. For sure.